loved you. What an awesome gift that is. Amen? Well, good to have you here, church. Good to see you guys. Happy Labor Day. I didn't get anyone gifts. I'm sorry. Just take the day off tomorrow, if you would. Just, uh, I'm going to do at least that for you. So uh, glad you're here. Second, uh, we're going to be in the second chapter of First John. So First John chapter ter- 2, turn in your Bibles, if you would, there. And uh, before we dive into the message, uh, life groups are starting over the next couple weeks. Here's what I'm going to uh, encourage you to do. The guys that said they're not starting till next week, show up this week. See what they do as far as hospitality. I'm just, I just want to just maybe we'll test them a little bit. Show up, see how they treat you. You know, uh, we may yank that life group. We don't know. You know, so, uh, but they're starting. And let me just tell you, life groups. We talked about it last week. It is just people getting together to live life on life relationships, just to get away from the surfacey. The, the facades, the, the superficial, and just to meet with people, to get to know them, just to, to encourage each other and to pray. And there's no agenda other than that, just to find other people uh, who want to love God and are desperate for Jesus, and we're all on the same path together. So lots of wonderful groups to choose from. Mike Bachmeyer's group uh, on Monday night, our group on Tuesday, uh, the Fagerbergers on Thursday night. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Fergusons and Leo Fowles on, on Thursday night. Um, uh, Kelly's leading a women's group here on Friday uh, around dinner time. So go ladies. Uh, Kelly, the other Kelly, male Kelly, is leading his on Wednesday mornings. Um, Carrie, why did I think? He's not here, is he? <laughs> wow. Kerry. I'm going to start calling him Kelly. So he's not here, is he? He can't defend himself. So, <laughs> Yeah, I know. Seriously. <laughs> Karma. <laughs> right here. Um, if you're facilitating a group, either leading it or it's at your house, just stand up. Because here's what I want. I want people to go, I know you're meeting on Monday nights. I want to come over. Tell me more. So just stand up, you guys. Hey, and the other Kelly's not here. So uh, if, if someone stood up near you, please just connect with them. And, um, you know, they may come to you. You may go to them. Their information's in the insert. Uh, just connect with them. So and then Carrie's group on Wednesday is a great group, too, just for the guys. And so uh, just praying that over these next few months, you just make deeper connections with people. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So praise God for people opening up their houses and making themselves available to you. Um, also, just to let you guys know, we as a church um, have not done anything tangible with uh, the, the hurricane situation in Texas, um, kind of waiting for things to settle figuratively and literally. Uh, but we have connections with people and ministries and churches, and so we are going to respond and help out those intentional relationships we have with people in Houston. So just so you know, your generosity is going to be a part of helping them. So thank you for allowing us to be blessed by you and your giving and allowing us to be a blessing to others. Because remember, it's less for us, more for others. And so I'll keep you all posted as far as uh, agencies and groups that we are purposefully working with in the Houston area just to help them get back to some sort of normalcy, even though it's going to take some time. So amen. And if you have some connections there personally with some ministries and organizations we can help, let me know. So go ahead and shoot me a a, a message. Uh, My email is in the life group information there. Or you can hit me up on Facebook. Or if you want to go old school, call me or text me. 480, here's my number, um, 480-8-PASTOR. 8-PASTOR. No, uh, just kidding. 480-390-4812. 480-390-4812. Now, if you text me or call me, I'm going to put your number in my phone, and I'm going to send you uh, messages throughout the week. So that's the trade. You can, you can have my digits, and I get to hound you with information. So um, let's pray for our uh, brothers and sisters in Houston. Let's pray for our time this morning. Father, um, thank you for the fact that we, we live in an environment, Lord, where we don't have to deal with severe climate issues other than heat. Uh, We praise you for that, and uh, I know we have people in other places that deal with far more severe weather situations, and right now, uh, Texas comes to mind, and Louisiana comes to mind, and 
Lord, it's going to be a, quite a process to, to bring restoration to this area. And I just pray you keep surrounding them with just incredible workers, men and women who uh, in, in all areas of expertise and skill are able to help people get back to, to their lives. Father, I pray that emotions and feelings and angers would, would not be present, but yet a, uh, a brotherly love and a, a compassion for one another would just rise to the surface. Lord, that you would just allow those folks to just get back to their, their routine, help them rebuild their homes and their lives, Lord. And uh, just thank you for the, the work that's already going on there to strengthen the resolve of everyone involved. And uh, we thank you for our time this morning. Father, be glorified as we look at your word. Thank you for Jesus, who, uh, who is our only hope and makes this time possible for us today. And we pray this in his name. Amen. All right, 1 John chapter 2. Um, I'll tell you right now that there might be a few of you that hate me after this morning's message, uh, but that's okay. I still love you, all right? 1 John chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 27, and I think most of us would agree that the world is filled with some spiritually wacko people. Would you, would you not agree with that? There are some people, like someone sent me a National Geographic article uh, a couple months ago and, and the title of the article was Five Men in the World Who Think They're the Messiah. Uh, and here's the crazy part about it. Not that there's five men in the world who think they're Jesus on earth, but the, uh, perhaps the craziest thing is that they have people following them. Uh, there's one guy who's maybe got a, uh, a crew of about five people, so we're not scared of that t- so much as the Messiah that's in Siberia who has 5,000 followers. Um, but, you know... History is filled with men who would become gods or think that they are a god, but what we celebrate here is that there's only one god who would become man, and that is the person, Jesus Christ. Um, some of you may have heard in the news this past week the, the spiritual guru in India that got convicted of raping two underage girls uh, in India, and he got 20 years and it brought about incredible riots in India where uh, dozens upon dozens of people were killed because the followers of this spiritual guru, who's known as the Guru of Bling, if that gives you any idea, uh, he even had his own movie made about him. And uh, I dare you to YouTube later, Guru of Bling movie, and just watch the trailer. It's fascinating. But even this guy has followers, and perhaps his followers thought it was okay for this spiritual leader to rape two underage girls. Uh, and somehow be justified in this. Uh, the world is filled with spiritual wackos, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some may even say that uh, even Joel Osteen himself, who has been in the news, and I feel sorry for uh, Pastor Osteen in, in one sense, right? Because here's a guy who now is the picture of uh, e- evangelicalism in the United States, and now we all who call ourselves followers of Jesus are kind of lumped into the Osteen camp. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not in the Osteen camp per se, but I feel bad that all of a sudden, uh, you know, here's a here's a Christian who perhaps doesn't make the correct decision or doesn't make it in an expedient way. And all of a sudden you're just lambasted by people. And some people would just say, oh, he's just another spiritual wacko. Here's my my prayer this morning is that we would not be a community of spiritual wackos. How's that for for a prayer? Lord, help us not be spiritual wackos. So how do we prevent? from going off the deep end spiritually? How do we prevent for, from being, becoming those, those spiritual wackos? And, and it has to do with truth. It has to do with spiritual truth and that there is spiritual truth that is absolute in this world. See, 1 John is going to deal with the topic of truth. And, and I love John because he loves contrasts. He talks about, uh, you know, he talks about light and darkness. He talks about love and hate. He talks about truth and lies. And we have to realize that we live in a world that has absolute truths involved in it. Even though recent polls have shown less than 34% of adults believe there's any absolute moral truth. Less than 34%, which means two out of three people in the world believe you could do whatever they want because there's no absolute truth guiding their steps or their decisions. You wonder why we're at such a difficult dilemma and an ethical impasse that we're at in our world? People don't believe in absolute truth. In the church, 
the statistics aren't much better. Less than 45% born-again Christians believe in absolute moral truth. That means out of every two of you, there's one of you that doesn't believe there's absolute truth. Now, someone may say there's no such thing as absolute truth. Well, right there, then and there, that absolute statement you just made is absolutely a fallacy because it's self-defeating. How can you say there's no absolute truth and yet make that statement absolutely? See, there is a foundational, important focus the Word of God has for us as followers of Jesus, who is the truth, like John Ferguson mentioned this morning, that ought to guide our steps. So here's what I want to encourage you this morning to do. How do we avoid being spiritual wackos? We know the truth. Well, how do we discern what is truth and what is false? John's going to talk about that this morning. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. It's where we're going to hang out. Oh, this just popped out of my Bible. Just this week I had a customer who gave me some uh, rave cards. Not to a rave. I only wish they were. But um, it is to a spiritual conference here in town. He knows I'm a pastor Thought I would be interested in going. What he didn't know is, oh, I'm more interested in ridiculing this. Um, because the top of the insert says, come to this conference because we are operating from the courts of heaven, releasing signs and wonders on the world. Wow, how do they get access to that? I mean, that's like an all-access pass that I'm not even aware of. Uh, And what this school is, it's a school of prophets. And they're basically going to tell you they've got a direct pipeline to God. And they're going to tell you things about your life that perhaps you can't find in the Bible. Scary. That you can't find in Jesus. Scary. That they themselves have this special God-ordained position because they occupy the courts of heaven. And they're going to tell you these things. But most Christians, I believe, would be like, oh, this looks fascinating. I'm going to go. No! Don't attend stuff like this. I'm going to tell you why. I am a pastor who loves not just you, but I love the Word of God. And I'm a pastor who God has given me and given you the gift of discernment. And there are things that are going on in the evangelical world that are unbiblical and do not glorify God. And yet it breaks my heart to see time and time again Christians buying these things hook, line, and sinker. And I'm sitting there going, where has the truth gone? Where are the men and women who love the truth of the Word of God? This has nothing to do with your feelings. This has nothing to do with your experiences. This has nothing to do with your emotions. This has to do with the objective truth of God. How do we discern truth from error? How do we discern what's true from lies? 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, those of you end times freaks, don't start salivating, right? Oh, Antichrist, who could it be? Barney the dinosaur? I don't know, maybe. Even many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would remain with us, but they went out in order that it might be shown that they were really not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. I have not written these things that you, uh, you know, verse 21, I reread it. Verse 22, who's the liar? but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let nothing or let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise which He Himself made to us, Don't miss it. Eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and it is true and not a lie. And just as he has taught you, you abide in him. 
May God bless the reading of his word this morning. There's two things I really want to focus on in this morning's message, and that is this. There's a, the importance of purity, and there's the importance of promise. So we are called to preserve the purity of the truth. There is a war for truth. There's always been a war for truth. There's no greater game that the enemy plays than to distract people from the truth. So we are called to be people who preserve the purity of the truth. But secondly, we are to also be people that are reminded that there is a promise when it comes to loving the truth. So I want to promote the promise of the truth. First and foremost, the purity of the truth. Three things we're going to look at here in 1 John chapter 2. And that is the work of the enemy in deceiving, the work of the enemy in those that are departing, and the uh, work of the enemy in those that are denying. So those are the three D's right there in your notes. So deceiving the flock, departing the fellowship, and denying the faith. As far as introduction into this section, look at verse 18 again. Notice John says two things that I really just want to kind of dispel right now. He says, right now, we are living in the end times. See, some of you are going, wait, the end times are not here yet. Yes, they are. See, we've been living in the end times since the first coming of Jesus, and the end times stop when Jesus comes again a second time. This whole period of time between the comings of Jesus are known as the last days, the last hour, the end time. So you can get rid of all your Kirk Cameron end times movies. You can get rid of all your J Jerry Jenkins, Tim LaHaye left behind books. Because honestly, I don't subscribe to that theology. Because notice what it says. We're living in the end times. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, they've always been with us. They will continue to be with us. The main thing is if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The end times are here, you guys. So we exalt the name and person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen? So we're living in at last days. So John wants you to be clear. Be prepared. These are the end of times. But secondly, notice that there's the mention of the Antichrist. I don't believe that there's one single Antichrist, as John mentions here. Matter of fact, the only f reference to Antichrist is found here in the book of 1 John, and he refers to a plurality of Antichrists. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is anyone who opposes the real Christ. It is a substitute for Christ. So those of you who are end times fanatics, the Antichrist could be Oprah Winfrey. The Antichrist could be Joel Osteen. The Antichrist could be your spouse. I don't know. But anyone who opposes Jesus is Antichrist. I'm tired of the Christian world getting, they, they salivate like crazy, like, oh, could it be, you know, Kim Jong-un, you know, is he the Antichrist? Well, maybe, you know, could it be, you know, Bashir Assad in Syria? Could it be, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu? Could it be Donald Trump? Could it be, it could be, because anyone who opposes Christ is an Antichrist. So we need to stop being so future fixated like the end times are coming. No, they're already here. And who could the Antichrist be? The Antichrist is anyone who denies Jesus. How's that for an end times explanation right there? All that the Bible says for us is be prepared because Jesus could come at any day, at any hour, at any time. Your concern is not to be overly fixated with Middle Eastern events. Your only concern is to be fixated with the Son of God. His name is Jesus. But yet, people will come in and try to deceive. See, here's the thing you have to understand. Is when Jesus came on the scene 2,000 years ago, he said, as the gospel spreads, so will deceit. So will falsehood. So will lies. He talked about the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13 and said, even in our churches, it looks like everyone's kind of growing up together and looks the same, but over time, there will be those that will be distinguished from the wheat and they will be called the tares and they will be among us, but they're not really of us. See, we have to understand that as the gospel spreads, so will a counterfeit gospel spread. So will counterfeit Christians spread. So will counterfeit righteousness spread. See, this is why counterfeit, counterfeiters don't do a $3 bill. Why? Because we all know $3 bills don't exist. Amen? So what they do is they take something that is real and they create a substitute. 
And that's why it is so hard sometimes to discern what's a real one and what's a fake one. And over time, I believe the true colors show. The tares make themselves known among the wheat. And so Jesus said, always be on alert because there are wolves in sheep's clothing that are in our churches and they're trying to spread lies and cause deceit in the body of Christ. The last church I passed through was interesting. One Sunday morning, I'm up doing a message and fairly good size uh, auditorium. And I see these two guys walk in after the service has started and they sit down and something within me just said, this is not right. And all of a sudden, you know, during the message, you know, they're kind of like talking to people around them. And all of a sudden, once the service ended, there's a crowd of people around them. And one of my leaders at the church came up to me and said, Scott, these guys are here and they're with a local cult. By cult, I I mean, they either deny Jesus, they deny Bible, they deny that salvation is by grace alone, et cetera, et cetera. And you should have seen how fast I beelined it to this group. And I said to these two guys in the eyes without blinking, you are not welcome here. Please leave. Why? Because I'm an unloving person. Love does not tolerate unbiblical truth. Love does not tolerate wolves with the sheep. You ask any rancher, like, you know, just open your doors to the wolves because you don't want to be unloving to those predators. Yes, you do. Because one of my jobs as a pastor is to preserve, help preserve the truth of God and protect the sheep from that which is detrimental to their health. And I beelined it to those guys and I quickly showed them the door out. Why? Because there are people in our churches that are susceptible to, to lies there are people forgive me for using the word that are gullible to half truths the danger is it looks so much like the truth but they mention jesus so but they mention the bible big deal there's a lot of people in the churches sowing seeds of deception And so we need to be on our guard and realize that Satan is not an originator. He is a counterfeiter. He cannot create anything new. He can only twist and distort that which is already out there. And in the words of C.S. Lewis, every inch of the universe is claimed by God and is trying to be counterclaimed by Satan. So John is very quick to say, we are living at the end times. Jesus said this. There are wolves among the sheep. There's, de- there's deception afoot. So much so that Satan masquerades himself as, a, as an angel of light, even so to try to deceive the elect. That's how crafty he is. And so there's a deceiving in the flock that we have to protect from, right? We have to pr- preserve the purity of the truth. Second point is this departing the fellowship because what happens is when there is a church that refuses to believe the lies those people find their way out the door and john says there were people in our midst and they're trying to create lies and stir up strife and controversies well because you church know the truth they did not find a foothold here they found the exit door Because even though they were with us, they weren't really of us. And as one pastor friend said, there are some who share our earthly company who do not share our heavenly birth. They may be here, but they're not really connected with us. And it's amazing that virtually almost every cult today was founded by someone who came out of the church. And probably one of the biggest ones is what we call Mormonism. See, Joseph Smith, some 150 years ago, received a message from an angel saying, Joseph, you know why it's hard to find a good church? Because all the churches that exist are wrong churches. You need to go start the true church. That's the lie. The vision he received from the angel Moroni was that all churches are evil. Can you imagine how many churches there were in the mid early 1800s? And all of a sudden, Joseph Smith now sets out to start the one true church. Can I just tell you right now, I'm not here to be unloving towards Mormons because most Mormons are morally responsible, good people. What's the one thing you hear when all of a sudden the topic of Mormons come up? It's like, but they're such nice people. They're such sincere people. Can I just tell you, be careful with sincerity 
Because you can sincerely believe something and be sincerely wrong. Just ask the brother who shot his brother because he sincerely thought the shotgun was empty. See, I went on a, on a killer ski trip uh, several years ago. We flew in the Salt Lake City. I'm going to tell you that there's amazing snow in Utah. And if you've never skied or snowboarded in Utah, it is awesome. But flying into Salt Lake City, there's an interesting thing that takes place in Salt Lake City where all the lights on top of the buildings in downtown point to the temple that's downtown. And on top of the Mormon temple is the angel Moroni. And all the lights downtown point to the angel. And so we thought it'd be fun to attend a tour of the temple when it was available. So we're done snowboarding and like shredding it, dude, right? You know, so we, uh, I got a little Bill and Ted's in me, I'm sorry. So we go to the temple and, you know, you just, you just feel that this is not right. This is not right. And so we're attending this tour and we basically had a plane to catch. So we're ready to exit and literally a group of leaders at the church stood in front of the door and wouldn't let us out of the church. And I thought to myself, well, I've never hurt a Mormon before. Maybe this is my first opportunity. Not that I was looking for an excuse, but we basically got in these guys' faces because they wouldn't let us exit the church. And we said, we have a plane to catch? Unless you're willing to book us on another flight, we need to go. Well, they gladly stepped out of the way. But I just thought to myself, this is kind of their tactic. You know, they look good on the outside, but they're really deceitful because it's... it's it, the fact that they're good people is not in dispute. Right living is one thing, but right doctrine is another. So don't sit there and go, Scott, you can't be. Yes, I can. Because you know what Mormons deny is they deny Jesus as the only son of God, the only one to the father. They deny a, a monotheistic faith that we embrace that there's one God. See, in Mormonism, you can become a God, exactly the lie that the Adam and Eve fell to in the garden. And I know a lot of Mormon people, but we are not afraid to tell them that they are wrong. Joseph Smith's testimony of his first vision is, is full of fallacies and lies and falsehood, and yet you have one of the fastest growing faith. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the truth, because you ask any Mormon about objectively what they believe, and they'll always tell you, but it was the burning inside that confirmed to them that this is the right thing. Well, I got a lot of burning going on inside. doesn't mean it's the right kind of burning. Alcatel's, it's last night's chili. Let's just be honest, Right? So you have to understand that there has to be objective truth. And you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Mormon, you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Jehovah's Witness, you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with anyone outside of Christianity, and they deny essential core beliefs of the Christian faith. I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, while we are to love our enemies, love does not mean we have to tolerate terrible teaching. So what about denying the faith? And I will tell you that it is much better to be divided by truth than be united by error. Okay? And people will say, you're narrow-minded, you're closed-minded, you're arrogant, you're, you know, it's like nothing I'm going to tell you is not found in the Scripture. It's all found there. So what about denying the faith? The third point, because what is John going up against? He's going up against men, women in the church saying, Jesus isn't the Christ. He's not the anointed one. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Son of God. They're diminishing the person and work of Jesus Christ. And those are those two bullet points right below denying the faith. The person of Christ, the work of Christ. And can I tell you, the Christological test, the test regarding Jesus is the crucial test. You ask somebody what they believe about Jesus, it's going to tell you a lot about where they're at with Jesus what they understand about Jesus. You want to know the big three that I'm going to die for at the end of the day? Here they are. Side notes, bonus points. Here we go. Three beliefs that you cannot bend on. These are what I call the bulldogmatic truths. Because I have three categories of truth in my life. There's the bulldogmatic, the dogmatic, and the puppy dogmatic, all right? Bulldogmatic truths I'm going to die for. Dogmatic, important truths to discuss, but not worthy of dying for. Puppy dogmatic truths are truths that we shouldn't even waste breath discussing. Right? What color should the carpet in the sanctuary be? Puppy dogmatic. Dogmatic, right? What kind of Bible translation should we use? You know, it's important discussion, but I'm not going to die for it. Bull dogmatic, I think there's three. And if you know these three, and they are the three that sets Christianity apart from any other cult, sect, 
religion, etc. Here they are. The deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and salvation by grace alone. Okay? Now, we can talk about, you know, virgin birth. We can talk about the second coming. Those are all good topics. But I'm going to tell you what. Usually, all cults, all sects, all uh, religions, all spiritualities either deny one, two, or all three of the ones I just mentioned. The deity of Christ, that Christ was God in human flesh, but also human, 100% humanity, 100% divinity. The resurrection of Christ, because Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then salvation by grace alone. You cannot your work your way into God's favor. It is a gift given to you through Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Okay, deity of Christ, you want some verses? Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, John chapter 14, verse 6. How's that? Is that good? So, these are the things we affirm. Jehovah's Witnesses deny them, Mormons deny them, Buddhists deny them, Hindus deny them, Muslims deny them. Do I not love these people? I love them. But I love them enough to say what you believe about Christ is wrong. The conclusions you've made from the scriptures are inadequate. They are inaccurate. That's why even the Jehovah's Witnesses had to come up with their own version of the Bible. And based upon the original languages, those original language experts say it is an atrocious translation. Because they've had to make it to fit their beliefs versus submitting themselves to what the Bible already says. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, correction, teaching, um, training in righteousness and, and, and for reproof so that the man and woman of God may be prepared for every good work. We affirm the scriptures. We don't believe that there's new scriptures. We don't believe that there's new revelation. Everything we have is right here. So how do you not deny the faith? You submit yourself to what's already been given to you. And you don't deny what's here. Because a denial of the faith is evidence that you really didn't know the faith. Okay? That's why they departed. They're not of us. Can I tell you, I had a friend who was with us in our last church who left and started virtual, almost a cult. He was with us and he was stirring up controversy. I told him he wasn't welcome here and they left. And they started a group that I would say is borderline cultish. So these three truths are important. Beware of deception. Be aware that those who try to deceive, if they don't find a foothold, they'll depart. But at the core of their MO is a denial of the faith. And can I just tell you as believers, followers of Christ, those of you who know Jesus personally, we will, as a church, affirm continually those three things I mentioned to you. The deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and salvation by grace alone. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay. Real quick, and I don't usually do this, can I just take a minute and I'll just open it up? Are we clear? Because this is, I mean, this is stuff I'm going to die for. And if there's any unclarity here, I want to make sure we, we deal with this because this is family time. Right? I'm your spiritual papa. Don't be calling me that, but I'm your spiritual papa, right? And I'm here because I love you. You know, like John says, little children, you're my, you're, you're my kids. And I want to make sure that the enemy doesn't find a foothold with deceiving you. Because I don't want you calling me going, hey, you know, is, uh, is Deepak Chopra cool? No, he's not. You guys don't even know who that is, do you? The guru of bling is not cool, Right? And that's why even within the church, I take grave issues with churches like Bethel Church and Hillsong Church and Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer. There is false teachings in these churches. And I'm going to be the guy that calls them out. Why? Because I love the gospel. And I don't want people deceived. Okay? Even Jesus calling. Some of you love that. Beware, there is inaccurate, unbiblical things there. But it's slipped into the church. 
It's got Jesus in the title. So what? So there's Jesus Christ superstar. I'm not living my life based upon that theology. I'm going to lean on my wife real quick. Anything that needs clarity. She did not look at my notes. That's where we're going. So let's not, let's not throw. <laughs> yep. Yep. You're that old. You don't look like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this looks good. I mean, there's Bible verses on here. I mean, it's pretty. It's full color. I don't know how much. It, but, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, it's got to be right. They're quoting Bible verses. No. Just because you have Jesus and Bible verses does not make it right. And Lori is, is spot on. Which brings us to the second point. This is where now I get to equip you and help you discern truth from lies, truth from falsehood, truth from error. Tim, Cheryl, well, I see your hands. I didn't know. All of a sudden we got charismatic, but yeah, Cheryl. Huge. Huge. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a reason even John mentions, right? Like, if you deny the Son, you deny the Father. There's a connection between it. And the Trinity is, it, I, I'd add it in there. But I'm going to say that those three ones that I mentioned, boy, if we become students of understanding what the Scripture says about that, we're going to be able to combat lovingly any error that exists. But great one. Trinity, second coming, virgin birth. We can all add those to the list. Norm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the lies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that truth is it talks about the, you know, it involves the deity of Christ because either he said he was who he said he was and then salvation by grace, that he secured that only way. See, in our philosophy, right, in our thinking, we go, but it's, it's, it's loving to include everybody else, right? It's loving to say, you know, we're all going to the top of the mountain, you're just taking a different road. No, because what's more unloving than telling them that, that Jesus is the only way is the truth that we are all wretched, rebellious sinners in desperate need of God's grace. Now try telling that to somebody who feels good about their life. Right? The exclusivity of Jesus has nothing with you being narrow minded. It has to do with what Jesus taught. And so someone says to you, Well, how dare you say Jesus is the only way? You're like, Don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. He's the one that said it. Right? So we promote the promise of the truth. Number two, and there's two things you need to understand about discerning right from wrong, truth from falsehood. And that is the importance of the anointing and importance of abiding. Those are the two major points. There is the promise of anointing that God has given you a gift and the gift is what? Himself. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 12, you have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 says God has made a, a down payment for your life called an earnest deposit. That is the Holy Spirit that if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior in your life, he's given you a gift according to John 14, John 16, that Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send another helper for you. And now God's deposited himself by means of the Spirit in your life. You've been anointed. That is a word that sometimes we just kind of throw around loosely today because, you know, we'll hear someone play the piano and be like, boy, that guy's anointed. You know, anointed is clearly connected with the word Christ. Okay? 
anointed and Christ come from the same root word. And so we ought to be careful with how we wor- use the word anointed because those who are truly anointed are those who have life in Christ. And you've been anointed by God. And what's amazing about this promise of the anointing is with the Spirit of God came the truth of God. With the Spirit of God came the Word of God. Now, here's the mind-blowing thing. You guys ready for blood to shoot out your eyes? All right, here we go. You have all of the, the wisdom and knowledge of God within you. The Holy Spirit brought with Him the mind of Christ. And according to Colossians chapter 2, you have it. Now, consider this. All the wisdom of the world that has anything to do with time and eternity has been deposited within you. It's almost like someone saying, hey, Scott, here, take this flash drive because I downloaded every bit of information from the Library of Congress onto it, and now it's yours. Are you kidding me? That's a lot of volumes. That's a lot of information. Well, what more would God want for his kids than to give you his mind? to give you his word, to give you his truth. And now it's in you by means of the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want you to consider as we talk about the anointing. There's the doctrine of revelation and there's the doctrine of illumination. And we need to be very clear with this because what the Spirit has given to you, according to John, is what you've heard from the beginning. It's not new revelation. If someone comes to you and says, I have new revelation from God, I want to add to the Bible, Job's Witnesses, Mormons, etc., etc., do this, right? Stay away because what you have in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books of the Bible, 39 Old Testament, 27 new, is all that you need. And these things are consistent in their message. They are non-contradictory with one another. There is a single line of a continual theme throughout the scriptures. And the most amazing part of it is that Jesus affirms it all. So you have the written word, but we also have the visible manifestation of the word. And his name is Christ. He's the way, the truth, the life. So all of a sudden now we have this deposit of the mind of Jesus according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. All wisdom and all knowledge that you need that is in the mind of Jesus is there. So revelation has been given to you. It's not new. It's not something that someone else has discovered. It's all right there within you. And so important point about revelation is it's, it's this. Um, it's this idea that what Lori said, everything you need has been given to you. So we need to become better students of the word, which brings us to the second point. And I'm going to illustrate it with a simple elementary illustration. So my, uh, my boys thought it'd be a good idea to build once again, the Lego millennium Falcon at our house. Um, if you don't know about Legos and you don't know about the Millennium Falcon, it's one of the larger, larger sets in, in Legos. Who's assembled Legos before, right? We, m- most of us have, right? It comes with a book. Well, the Millennium Falcon comes with three thick books on how to build this thing. This thing is a multi-week project, right? And so, like, we worked on it for about two hours the other night, and I think we got done with, like, five pages, um, Because the key thing is, all the pieces we have, it's looking for the pieces among all the other pieces. And when my kids have other sets of Legos and they all kind of go into one box, we're going, well, the pieces are here. How do we find them? And there was one piece the other night we were looking for, and we're digging and digging and digging. And then someone came up with a bright idea, me, that literally we would go get a flashlight because we're kind of thumbing around in the dark. I'm going to tell you, when you bring that flashlight in and you look for the pieces, all of a sudden now things pop out. And what took me so much time took so little time because of the flashlight that helped us find the piece we needed at that moment. That's the gift of the Spirit as well. Not that the Spirit has not just given you revelation, the mind of Christ, but now the Spirit illuminates what has been given to you so you see accurately what God wants you to know at that moment. 
See, we as believers forget the gift that the Spirit brings with illumination. John chapter 14, John chapter 16. And the Spirit will come, Jesus says, and He will lead you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. He will convict you of sin. He will show you righteousness. You as a believer need to avail yourself to that work. This is not just something that just happens. You have to want it. You're going to have to ask for it. And James says the reason you don't have is because you don't ask. See, believer, it is time, like Lori said, to step up and become intimately acquainted with the Word of God. Not looking for something new. I don't want you to chase fads. I don't want you to chase what's fashionable. I just want you to pick up the Scriptures and become a better student of the Word of God. Amen? It takes discipline. It takes time. But I'm going to tell you right now, you are more than equipped for the work. Because why? You've been given the mind of Christ, revelation, amen, and you've been given the Spirit to help you make sense of what is there. And the only reason perhaps I'm up here and, and, and you're not because you're sitting there going, I couldn't do what you do. I don't have anything different that you don't have. Except for an education where I just said, I'm going to devote myself to this. But everything at the rudimentary level that is available for what God wants is in all of our lives by means of God's love through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen? So here's the cool thing. You and I, we have the same, same gift from God. I just chose to pursue a course in understanding these things to encourage you, but I'm going to tell you what's available to you is the same thing that's available to me. Become better students of the Word of God and allow the r- illumination of the Spirit to help you make sense of these things because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man does not understand the things of God. Why? Because Paul says they are spiritually appraised. Meaning, you, if you're in Christ, are the smartest people in the room. Why? Because you know Jesus. Now, let's showcase that wisdom by diving into it, by allowing us to be impacted by it, and allowing us to share it with the world. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there is no one who can argue against someone who is confident in their faith in Christ. When I was a first first believer, baby believer, I used to be intimidated by people. And then I started exploring what I said I, I, I believed. And now, guess what? I can go toe-to-toe with an atheist, a Satanist, a Republican, a Democrat. I mean, you name it. I go toe-to-toe with anybody and be confident in my faith because I know what I believe. And I have more confidence in what I believe than what anyone else says they believe in their worldview. And the good news is, I don't have to prove it. Eternity will prove that out. Because it's all about Jesus. That's the promise of anointing, ladies and gentlemen. That's the beauty of anointing. But the last one, and let me unpack the the illumination part out a little bit more, is about the promise that comes from abiding. You can't have the illumination if there's no abiding. And what is abiding? It is an intimate connection with God and His truth. There's no more important task that you have as God's kid than to spend time with Him, and that comes primarily through His Word. There are three things you need in life to make it through as God wants you to make it through. It's it's the Word, it's the Spirit, and it's others who are like-minded to encourage you in that. Right? And all come through Jesus, yes, we agree with that. But there's two things, three things I want you to know out of this. I want you to learn to accept the truth. We need to pull up our big boy, big girl pants and accept the truth. Because here's the thing about the truth. Sometimes we don't want to hear what's true. But you have to accept it if you want what's best for you. How many of us would rather follow our own truth than God's truth? How many of us, when we're caught in a point where it's like, boy, I really want to honor God, but this just feels so good, so we're going to pursue this path? You have to accept the truth. But number two, you have to also interact with the truth. You have to let it possess you and grab you. You have to wrestle with it. 
wrestling is an intimate thing. I used to have a, you know, when I had PE wrestling in high school, it was weird just to have another dude like fully like round you, right? And yet the, the, the word of God invites you to do that. Test and see that it's true. Interact with it and let it possess you because here's what you're going to find is that the truth of God always satisfies. The truth of God always speaks to the deepest places of our lives. And there's something within us that confirms with God's spirit that, yes, this is the right thing. I have never uncovered biblical truth that I thought, nope, this is just not settling well. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, when lies come through other faiths and other religions and someone says something, boy, there is this internal detection system called the spirit that says, through discernment, that's not right. Scott, did you hear? You can be married to other women as well. What? I'm fine with one, and she's amazing. I'm, I'm good, right? But where, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like, where in the truth can you find it? Well, it's not really there, but it came through our, pro- what? Come on. You accept what's given. You interact with it. You spend time with it. You allow it to possess you and grab you. But the third one of being controlled by the truth. To obey is to abide. When God tells you to do something, you do it. When God says don't do something, you avoid it. And this is where feelings and emotions do not come into consideration because you will talk yourself out of things that God wants you to do. Forgive them, I can't. And he says, what do you understand about my love for you? I'm glad God doesn't say, I can't forgive you, Scott Morgan, because there's just some sin so heinous. No. You know, I've got to love my enemies. I've got to pray for those who persecute me. I've got to forgive people. I've got to live a life that is so countercultural that doesn't make sense to the world, and yet God says you do it whether you feel like it or not. This is how we abide. We invite it in, we interact with it, and then we allow it to control our every step. Read Galatians chapter 5 this week on what it means to walk by the Spirit. Too many Christians are walking by the flesh. We need more believers to walk by the Spirit. Real quick, write these five words down. Because you may be wondering, because I called out some people you thought, I thought they're good churches and good people. Here's here's the key. Five things to know whether it's something good or bad. Bonus points, I'm just throwing them out. Does it pass, number one, the, the Bible test? When Pastor Osteen writes a book, and there's not one shred of biblical connection in it. When the, the host of CNN is interviewing him and saying, you're a Christian pastor, how come there's no Bible references in your book? Are, are you freaking kidding me? Even the CNN host realizes there's something not right? Okay. Is the, the, what's coming your way, does it cite the scripture? Does it, uh, does it pass the Bible test? Are they referring to passages that in and of themselves, does it make sense? Like, yeah, that's what it says. Number two, does it pass the Jesus test? Does it magnify Christ or does it minimize Jesus? Again, another pastor in a charismatic movement in our country, the citations to Jesus and Christ were so minimal, it caused cause for concern among critics i mean i'm going to tell you right now jesus is an essential part maybe the most essential part so does it point us to the word does it magnify the personal work of jesus christ number three does it pass the character test meaning does it promote godly living 
Or does it promote some sort of fad that we should be teaching, some sort of secret knowledge in the church? Oh, you didn't know this? That every other letter in the Bible, there's actually a secret message there, and if you learn the secret message, you can understand all conspiracies. No! Don't be chasing those rabbits with fluffy tails, even though they're cute! Good biblical teaching promotes good godly living. Number three, does it pass the decency or order test? Does it fuel the church with chaos or does it encourage us to be an ordered, decent people? Are our ways well thought out? And lastly, does it pass the evangelism test? Does it help people get to Jesus or does it hinder them from knowing Jesus? Those are five things. As you interact with things outside the scriptures, you need to be aware of. And I, as your pastor, just want to pass along to you. And I just want to thank you, number one, for being here. I want to say thank you to you who allow me to unpack the word every Sunday. I love it. I mean, honestly, I approached this message today and there was almost something within me that was like resistant. And you know, I needed to fight against it because these are things we need to know. Because there's people that are trying to sneak in and they're trying to sabotage your faith. And I will not allow the wolves to come in who are dressed in sheep's clothing. I will not allow the world to try to feed you a diet of something you don't need. We're going to center our focus on the person and work of Christ and the Word of God. So I thank you for being a church that allows me to do this and to, to, to lead you in this way. My prayer is that you will live, love the truth, live the truth, crave the truth, desire the truth, and just obey the truth. God's going to be glorified in that. Amen? If there's a side conversation we need, let me know. If there's an email you need to send me, let me know. We can talk more, but I love you guys. And thank you for this time. Let's pray. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, I, I know that somehow, some way, you know, you knew that the journey would be a difficult one for, for your kids. Like John referenced earlier, there's the broad way and there's the narrow way. And boy, sometimes we have a hard time discerning what, what path we're on. And the broad way looks so good. And why wouldn't we want to take that? And yet you, you beckon us to the narrow way. Because it's the narrow way that leads to life. And Lord, I, I just, I'm thankful that you're a God who loves wandering people. You're, you're a God who loves people who sometimes don't accept your truth. And I'm just glad you've met us at this time in this place. To show us what is right and what is true and what is correct. My prayer is that this stuff would not puff us up and make us so prideful that we think we have something on somebody else, but it would make us more loving and accepting, but yet more confident in our engagement with those people. So Lord, thank you for giving us this time Please direct our steps and help us point people to the truth, i.e. Christ. And help us continue to abide in that wonderful relationship you've so wonderfully given to us. We only love you because you first loved us. And we pray this in Christ's name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day off. Great week. We'll see you soon, all right?